Um, my name is Paul Waite and I am currently design manager for Urban Design Studio. A, um, we are a branding and design studio based here in Cork and we brand and build and create pretty much everything you can imagine. It really is a 360 kind of service and we do it all from the ground up. So logos, websites, store fit outs, uh, office interiors, custom wallpaper, you name it and, and we can do it. And um, it really is a kind of this fantastic and creative environment to work in. And I'm kind of really looking forward to honestly getting back into the office. So, uh, and I'm not just saying that because they're watching. Uh, I mean that. Um, me personally, um, I've been a visual designer now for over 10 years. I have a degree in visual communications. I have a master's in digital marketing strategy, um, diplomas in user experience, user interaction and psychology, as well as a whole bunch of Udemy courses that have no relevancy here whatsoever. Um, and throughout my career, I've worked on everything from international to startups to local companies from marketing campaigns to rebrands, absolutely everything. So it's really been a very career. And it's something that I still to this day enjoy doing. And as you can tell from today, enjoy talking about. So I'm looking forward to getting started. Um, and today's talk, as uh, I mentioned, is called Bias by Design. Now, a quick overview of what I hope to get through with you today, uh, time permitting, of course, is we're going to start at the very start with what is cognitive bias. And then we're going to run through 10 commonly used biases with examples. Um, I've hopefully I've simplified these examples down to a very basic so they're easy to kind of follow along with because sometimes when you get into a subject and you know about it it gets a bit complicated but hopefully these are all just kind of are very easy to follow and uh, lastly I have a very small bit on how we can avoid and reduce bias so <clears throat> excuse me a quick caveat here I'm going to be coming at these biases specifically from a kind of a marketing and design point of view um, I know that biases are obviously very very common in social and political scenes, but I am not going near that. I'm not walking through that minefield. There's enough arguing on the internet without having us, us having to discuss this. So when I talk about these today, I'm, I'm going to be coming from, let's say, a branding and a corporate kind of point of view rather than the social and political aspect of it. Um, so just kind of bear that in mind when we're going through these. These biases are not unique at all to branding and marketing. They, they can be used across pretty much every aspect of life. Um, so today, though, I'll just be talking, as I said, from a marketing and design, a brand and a corporate point of view. So um, with that all said, let's jump into it. And as I said, start at the beginning with what is cognitive bias? So the sad truth of it is, and I'm sorry to tell you all, is that as humans, we are not as rational as we think. Uh, bias is all around us. It is everywhere. We uh, see it every day. We use it ourselves. We are subject to it. And the interesting, albeit strange part, is that we do not know if we are being biased or not. So cognitive bias is also known as uh, unconscious bias. And those two terms, if you do your own research and you Google them and you start looking them up, you can see that those two terms are used quite interchangeably. Um, now, according to research, the average adult makes 35,000 decisions a day. Um, in saying that, I'd say if you're a parent, that probably doubles, but the average adult makes 35,000 decisions a day. Now, these are all the decisions. These are work, family, social, financial, big decisions and small, consequential and absolutely insignificant. These are every decision you will make from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. And within these 35,000 decisions, we're regularly presented with scenarios where either the information we have is imperfect or we do not have all the relevant information to make an informed decision. And in these scenarios, we unknowingly rely on our bias to help make those decisions. So bias is an umbrella term and it refers to the systematic way we process information that deviates from rational objectivity. So when I came up with this um, kind of succinct description, I, I chose my words very carefully. So when I say systematic, it is, it's inbuilt in, in us. It's, we all have bias somewhere in us, some more so than others. Some have different biases. We might even not have all the same biases, but they are in there and they are automatic. As I said, that cognitive bias is also known as unconscious bias. So it's not something we consciously think of and do. Um, another important word there is, is deviate. So we deviate from rational objectivity. So when bias kicks in, we are not void of fact or information. It, it's not like we just forget about it and leave it and go 
you know, going the other direction. We just, we take it in, but we just deviate from it. So it's not that we're void of fact, it's just that we deviate from it. So when we take in information and we take, and we, we make a decision and we're processing information, as humans, we create a subjective reality based on our perception of that information. So our brain takes it in and we interpret that how we see it so and it's probably no surprise to people that you could have two people looking at the same object or the same piece of information and they can interpret it differently and your brain will interpret it as it sees it and that may not be always how it is and if there are any gaps or information missing or there's a fear or there's an unknown there your brain will do its best to help you make that decision and fill in those gaps and it will fill it in from a multitude of ways either from past experience would probably be the most common one. But it also things like your current emotional state at the time, or, or even more dangerously, your brain can actually see what it wants to see rather than what something actually is. So there are a lot of biases out there. There is a document called the Cognitive Bias Codex, and that keeps a track of all the kind of research and known biases out there. And according to the codex, there's over 180 biases. Um, some of these um, will almost contradict each other. Some of them are quite similar and will, may even overlap, but they all do have this common characteristic, which on top of our own individuality and our own ability to interpret things, they all lead to decision-making and a process of information that, as I said, deviates from rational objectivity. So I've kind of, I've almost kind of described all these biases as, as negative and, and they can be, but they also can be on the other end where they, they can be quite good. And they help us, as I said, fill in those gaps and they help us process information and make decisions quickly and efficiently. But on the other end of the spectrum, they can be used, you know, as the term is, as for evil. And they allow us, they allow us to make irrational decisions. And no surprise that companies out there are very aware that these biases exist and they can use them to their advantage um, to nudge us in, in a specific direction or, or kind of lead us down the path that they want us to go in. Um, and it's important to note there that, that these biases exist, whether companies use them or not. So the companies aren't necessarily tricking us. It's not like they're lying to us or fooling us. They're, they're simply using something that exists to help sell a product, which you know is, is basically marketing in a nutshell. So. Again, these, they're not kind of tricking us or fooling us. These, these biases exist and they simply use them to our advantage. And again, they, they nudge us in a specific direction. Um, so just to sum all that up uh, again, what is cognitive bias? Cognitive bias is the systematic way we process information that deviates from rational objectivity. So I'm gonna jump into the actual, um, the individual biases now, and I'm going to start with one that is uh, almost a common phrase now. I think everybody will know of this one and probably have in their lives involved some way. And it is, of course, the, the bandwagon effect. Now, the bandwagon effect is infamous. It's It's been around for a very long time. It, it's used in social and political scenes. Obviously, it's it's it was very popular in wartime propaganda. But it's a very simple and to this day still very regularly used bias. And the, the principle of the bandwagon effect is that if uh, a consumer basically is more likely to purchase something that other people are purchasing. And more so, the more people to buy something, the more likely that consumer is to buy it. Um, and it's, it's, it's that simple. It's, it's the bandwagon effects creates an illusion that if there's a bunch of people buying a specific product, then that means that specific product must be good when it might not be, or that that product is better than the competitor's product when again it might not be or even that a product is is useful when it might not be at all and it's it's very regularly used and it's kind of grown and adapted as well to the the digital environment that we kind of find ourselves in now and it's presenting itself in slightly different ways all kind of leading to the same end goal obviously and all being the bandwagon effect but they're slightly different in their approach and i'm going to show you now four uh, examples of screenshots i took in the last few weeks of the bandwagon effect in action online so i'm going to specifically talk with digital terms with this one so the first one is on the top left of your screen there zoom um, i'm sure we're all very familiar with zoom and by familiar of i mean sick of but so zoom if you're on their home page uh, they have this rotating list of uh, 
basically companies that use their service. And these aren't just the small kind of local companies. These are the big dogs. These are the guys with money to burn. As you see there, the logo 20th Century Fox, Uber, Zendesk. These are big names using this product. And this is a very simple and you know well-known technique. It, it's these big guys and these massive companies are using our product and they could use any product. They have the money to use every, any product they want to, but they use ours. So if it's good enough for them, it must be good enough for you. Very simple and, and it works. It, it's a very simple technique and you'll see it used very regularly on websites. Um, the second uh, on the top left of your screen here is uh, testimonials. Now, I'm not gonna get into an argument about testimonials because testimonials, I'm a big fan of them. I think they're great, but I'm only a fan of them when they're used in the, let's use the example of Amazon, where you can read the five star comments and the one star comments, and you can see the good and the bad. Where testimonials are used a bit more, let's say cheekily, they're not, again, they're not wrong. This isn't, they're not lying, but <laughs> they're used a bit more cheekily is that if you have a company that has three or four testimonials on their website and they're these glowing reviews of how amazing the company is, and they are true, there's in them, and I'm going to assume they are, I assume the company doesn't write them themselves, but it's when you can't compare the good and the bad and they only show you the good. It's, you know, it's like these guys think we're great. So obviously we must be great. Come and use our service. So it's just, it's almost, it's not really lying. It's just a one-sided view. Uh, third, and the bottom left of your screen here is, um, it's, this is a WordPress setup. It's a WordPress tutorial site. And if you want to the description page, they have the top line says more than 250,000 websites. Now, if you're new to this, or you're, you, and if you probably would be if you're looking for a tutorial site, that's a big number. And that, that's a very kind of promising start to the decision you've just made. It's like 250,000 other websites have used this service. Then it definitely has to be good because so many people have used it. So we're going to ignore the fact that there's billions of websites out there that didn't use this website. It's just that they're focusing on the 250,000 that did. So it must be a good service. Um, and again, not lying, just stating a very clear and fact of how great they are. Last, and I will say uh, the least, is influencers. Now, influencers, I think the term is so common and every day now that we forget that their job is literally to influence us into doing something or making a decision or purchasing something. And influencers are, you know, they are the bandwagon effect incarnate. They have, so here you have this, this pretty person living this amazing lifestyle that you'd love to lead and they're using this product Therefore, if you use that product, you could be more like them or you could you know, look to achieve or it must be great because they have all the money in the world and they use this product. So it must be the greatest product available in that category. And it just so happens that they have a code on their site there that you can use to get a discount and they make money from. So that's, that's very simply that's for quite, you know, altering similar but slightly altering versions of the bandwagon effect in action online um and it's really come into its own in the digital realm and they're all they're all kind of these are all commonplace things but it's just interesting to see them in a slightly different ways again none of them are lying i'm not saying they're lying i'm just saying that you know it's swinging in their favor and um, so the next bias is i would say more common than the bandwagon effect but not as maybe as well known but not as well known as bandwagon effect and it's called the framing bias now the framing bias is simple. The framing bias is simply making a decision based on how the information is presented to you rather than the information as a whole. So you, uh, best analogy I can come up with, if you can sum up a lawyer's job in a, a phrase, it is the framing bias. So I'm sure we've all become very familiar with Netflix and serial killer documentaries, or maybe it's just me, but um, if you're ever watching a documentary or a court case and you have the prosecutor versus the defense attorney. And what's very interesting with this is you have these two sides, uh, opposing sides, and they both have access to the exact same information at the exact same time, the same evidence, the same statements, the same testimonials, they have access to everything. And yet when they stand up to make their case, it's like they're talking about two completely different situations. Like one person is saying this did happen, the other person is saying it didn't happen. And it's always, it's quite fascinating to watch. And that is literally the framing, framing bias in, in action. That is the same fact presented in two different ways can lead to a very different judgment and a very different decision. Um, and 
I'm going to use an example now and take it way back from the seriousness of a serial killer uh, court case. And this is more of an everyday example. So if you imagine, as I'm sure most of you are, we're working from home. And I don't know if you have the problem, but me, myself, I'm constantly picking on biscuits. So I want to have a nice healthy snack. And I walk down the dairy aisle and I see this poster for this 80% fat-free natural yogurt. And I'm like, that's brilliant. That's, that's what I need. I need a nice healthy snack natural yogurt looks very healthy and on top of everything it's 80 percent fat free i need less fat in my life so if that's great and that works and we regularly see this stuff but if you simply flip that fact around to the other side and you say 20 percent full fat it doesn't come across as healthy as 80 percent fat free and it is the same fact as in the fact is if it's 80 percent fat free then there's 20 percent fat still in there um now Obviously, it depends on the size of the product, uh, if that's a lot of fat or not. But again, neither one of these is lying. It's the same fact. It's just 80% fat free is just putting that slight more of a positive spin on it. And um, and again, it's not lying. It's not negative. And I, I wouldn't recommend that they put 20% full fat on it. But it's just a case of if you are placed with this decision or this, this is in front of you, just remember that, that if 80% of something is there, there's 20% of something missing. So it's a framing bias that you make a decision based on how the information is presented to you rather than the information as a whole. So um, next up is another interesting one. It's called a decoy effect. Now, the decoy effect is, is a phenomenon whereby a consumer will change their preference between two objects when a third one is introduced. And this third object is known as the decoy and it is asymmetrically dominated. So what I mean by asymmetrically dominated is that the decoy, the third item introduced is priced purposely to make the other options much more attractive to the, to the buyer. So it is dominated in terms of perceived values, quantity, quality, extra features and so on, whatever, whatever it is. Um, now, this third item, this decoy effect, is not intended to sell. It's, it's not intended to sell at all. It is simply there to nudge you into the direction of what is known as the target object, which would either be more expensive or more likely more, more profitable. So this, just to say that the decoy effect, I'm specifically talking about two objects and a third one being introduced. This can work with more objects, so 10 objects and 15 objects, etc. But it just gets mathematically more difficult to work out. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. So it's um, two objects, a third one is introduced and someone will change their preference. And I'm going to just give a visual representation, hopefully of how I describe that. So you're going picking up your coffee on your way to work when you're allowed to leave the house again. And you go to Starbucks and you see two options. There is a grande for 575 and there is a short for 245. Now this decision is very simple. Either you want a lot of coffee for more money or you want less coffee for less money. Um, it's, it's black or white, it's, it's A or B, it's a simple choice. Either you want more or you want less and the prices are relative to the size of coffee. It's very simple. But as soon as you introduce a third item and here we have the medium or as Starbucks like to call it a tall for 475. Now, having a medium has become a standard in almost everything. It's, it's everywhere. But the tall here is, is dominated and asymmetrically dominated in terms of price. So it's more than two euro more expensive than the short, than the small. But it's only a euro more expensive to get a grande. So when you're looking at this, your brain kind of clicks in and goes, well, you, you know, there's something not right about this. So you, you kind of say, oh, I might as well just go for the grande. It's only a euro more expensive. And if I don't want the coffee, I just simply won't drink it. Now, that that product was introduced only to push you in that direction. That's the only reason it was introduced. It's priced, it's it's purposely pricing you out of buying it, so that the, the bigger one, the Grande Five Seventy Five, actually looks like great value. Even though, even if the middle one wasn't there, it would be the same price. It just looks better now compared to the decoy object, um, and this works in every pricing uh, kind of structure. And it's it's it kind of, if you Google this one yourself, you'll see it used all the time. It, the movie popcorn is the most famous kind of example used for this. And I can promise you when you're allowed, allowed back out to go to the cinema again, that if you are standing in the queue for your popcorn, I promise you, you will hear someone say it at some stage saying, we might as well just go for the large. It's only 50 cent more, 50 cent more expensive. And that's literally the decoy effect in action in front of you. Um, that's the decoy effect. Uh, next up is a um, 
the is lasso version. Now, lasso version is is a simple one, but it's also quite a tricky one because it can go quite deep psychologically speaking, which obviously I'm not going to dive into, but it, it is something that needs to be mentioned because it is it is quite a deep one. Now, lasso version, simply put, is when it's better not to lose something than it is to gain something. Now, basically, so as back to the corporate kind of terms that as a buyer incorporates a product or a service into their lives, it gets very, very difficult to then remove that service from their lives. Um, and this is because as as humans, we we view scaling back as a loss. That's how we view it. If we have to scale back on something, we view it as a loss. And scaling back then becomes a very emotionally challenging decision, In no matter how big or small. I mean, if you go to the extreme sides of it and you say you're living in this lovely five-bedroom house in the middle of the city with a little garden with two bathrooms, and but you're struggling to pay your mortgage. So you go to the bank and you say, what do we do? And they say, sell the house, move further outside of the city and buy a two bedroom house. You will. And logically, this is this is this is the answer. This means you will get most of your mortgage paid off. You will not struggle to make payments anymore. But what happens is as a person, you kind of think I can't afford my mortgage. Have I failed? Have I failed as a person? Have I failed as whatever it is? I mean, what happens when now someone wants to stay over and there's no spare rooms? I won't have an office in my house anymore. I won't be in the city. I won't be able to walk to work. And all of these things that you're not going to lose, that, that you are going to lose, apologies, start, are, are kind of at the forefront of your head rather than the fact that you're going to gain, you know, a stress-free life and an ability to pay your mortgage. You're going to have money back in your account. So I'm going to take right back away from that very serious scenario and give a lot less serious <laughs> example here. Um, and I'm going to say something that happened to me and is still happening to me, and I'm not ashamed to say I fell for it, is Netflix. Now, we are all very aware of free trials. Free trials are loss aversion happening in real life. So a free trial, and it happened to me with Netflix. So I signed up for Netflix maybe four or five years ago, well before there was a pandemic and it became an absolute necessity to have. Um, so basically they, they ask you to sign up, cancel any time, you get seven days free. So there was a series, I can't remember what it was, that I wanted to watch on Netflix. And I said, look, I'll sign up for the free trial. I'll get it watched in seven days and I'll just, you know, cancel it and no need to worry about it anymore. But of course, as soon as I started watching that show, I started talking to people and they said, have you seen this? If you like this show, you'd like this show. And then I said, oh, I'll watch that show. Oh, my seven day free trial ended. So now I have to sign up for the month in order for me to watch this show. So then I say, look, I'll sign up for the month and I'll pay one month and then I'll watch the show and I'll cancel it. And then that process just continues. And all of a sudden, not having it becomes becomes hard for me because there may be a series that comes up that I, I'll miss out on. Or what if, what if a movie comes out that everybody's watching and I won't be able to see it because I don't have Netflix. And you start considering all the things you won't have or even potentially will not have by not having the service in your life. Rather than thinking of the gain, of having 10 euro or whatever it is a month back in your account. Um, and that's the last version. It's, it's a lot less serious example, but that's the last version effect. You start scaling back is very difficult. And you start thinking about what you will lose by not having this rather than what you will gain by not having it. And so last version. Um, next up is an effect called the halo effect. Now the halo effect is probably personally my favorite. Um, and very simply, the halo effect is, I say favorite as if I like it happening. I don't like it happening. I think favorite is it's the most interesting to me. Um, so the halo effect is when a person shows favoritism towards a company as a whole based on one experience or one individual product. Um, and the same can be said for people. If you meet someone and, and they have one endearing quality about them, you automatically assume that everything about that person is great or that person's great because they were nice to me, even though they might be a terrible person. Um, so the halo effect, the reasoning is, is quite logical when you think about it, that if you use a product by a company and that product is great and you use every day and it never lets you down and it's very useful, then you automatically assume that everything else that company does must be as good as what that product is. That's the standard they have for everything. Um, and logically, you know, you can see where the thought process is, but it still is at the forefront an assumption that because they do one thing good, they can do everything good. And it allows companies to parlay into new products and new services that were never practical, you know, part of, you know, what they were going to do before, simply because now everybody thinks they're great at this. Now, the reason I find 
the halo effect so interesting is because unlike the previous examples I've just mentioned, which were asking you to almost complete a specific task at a specific time, this is the halo effect is more long term. It's more overall. It's kind of a branding exercise, shall we say? So it kind of it, it, you're in there for the long term with the halo effect. So with that said, the example I'm going to give here isn't obviously a specific thing happening in a specific kind of, you know, individual moment. This is more of a, a kind of a branding exercise, as you'll see now. So I'm going to use, and it couldn't be a better way to use it, is Apple. Now, as you can see from this dancing silhouette and the iPad that pretty much don't exist anymore, um, they had this famous campaign um, back in 2005 that the silhouettes were dancing around the place and it was parodied it was huge it was a brilliant campaign at the time but the first ipod was actually released in 2001 so in 2001 the first iPod, first ipod was released we were all still pretty much using cd players and everything but it wasn't until four years later in 2005 that apple focused a large amount of their marketing budget on the ipod now when this happened it was quite strange for a number of reasons uh one that's the, uh, the MP3 scene was was already booming. It was already a big thing that everybody now had an MP3 player, whether it was an iPod or not, that it was already growing. Um, but two, and very strangely on paper, let's say from an outside perspective, is that Apple had much bigger revenue drivers, personal computers, obviously, software and different things. Um, and the issue for Apple at the time, um, back in kind of the early 2000s, is that they weren't winning in the personal computer market. They, they weren't offering anything more than what their you know, counterparts were offering, except that they were slightly maybe better looking. So this focus on the iPod and pushing their large marketing budget on top of it was a very strange move, but <laughs> be it an absolutely genius move. What ended up happening that year in 2005, Apple's fiscal year sales increased 38% and profits by 384% huge increase and more interesting than that is that iPod and iTunes only accounted for 39% of Apple sales that year so you had 38% increase uh, in, in overall sales and a profit of over 300% increase nearly 400% and where you focused all your marketing only accounted for 39% and this is this is the halo effect, you know, in action. So basically, Apple anchored their marketing on one product that they did at the time to be fair better than anybody else. And when everybody used this product and saw how good it was and how stylish it was and and how ahead of its time it was with its screen and everything, they saw Apple as this kind of technology leader, as this innovative company, as as the best and most forward thinking, you know, choice. And because the iPod was good that meant that their laptops had to be good. That meant that their earphones had to be good. That meant that their iMacs had to be good. And Apple have ingeniously done this again and again and again with their iPhone and the iWatch. And in none of these products were, were uh, Apple you know, first to the market. They didn't invent MP3 players. They didn't invent you know, touchscreen phones or, or iWatch. They simply perfected the marketing of them and they perfected the style of them and they did enough with them that people saw them as the kind of pinnacle and this is it and it's true even I'm, I'm not a big apple user but i will compare a lot of stuff to apple products even though i know that they don't offer anything more physically so that is the halo effect in action and, and as i said a long-term branding exercise but if done correctly can do amazing things for a company <clears throat> um, so next up is an effect called the barnum effect now the barnum effect is one that is probably going to cause a few arguments but uh, it was named after a man named P.T. Barnum, who was a showman back in the 1800s. And P.T. Barnum famously said, there's a sucker born every minute. So you can nearly see where this is going. So the Barnum effect is um, for people who kind of who like horoscopes or, or mediums and psychics or, or, you know, those free online personality tests, you know, those those kind of that kind of area. And it's where individuals believe that maybe personality descriptions are apply specifically to them more though more so than other people even when that description is quite general and could apply to anyone if not everyone so from let's say a marketing perspective the barnum effect allows companies to almost communicate with a with a person one-on-one -on -one through an ad campaign even though that ad campaign is speaking to tens of thousands of people at a time um, it's a very very effective um technique and it's very simple to use so if you think of even let's say the most basic um, example would be email marketing email marketing 
if you get an email from a company, excuse me, uh, in, in your inbox and it says, dear customer, you are just a cog in a wheel to them. And you kind of know that from the very first word or two words, I should say, you know that you're just nothing to them. But if at the top it said, hey, Paul, then I kind of feel a bit more engaged. I feel like, oh, these guys, you know, they use my name. And the same goes for account pages and login pages and social media marketing has gotten that good now that it's almost that specific. And it makes you feel like this company is talking to you when in fact, you're literally a name in an Excel sheet and there's an algorithm filling in the blank with your name. So it's, um, it's a very interesting one. And Spotify and Netflix use this brilliantly as well with their suggested for you kind of areas. And uh, I think it was Spotify a couple of years ago. I don't know if those of you who are on Spotify, you have that yearly review and they were caught basically sneaking songs in there that you never listened to, but they needed to get the numbers up on. So they were just pushing kind of popular music in there even though you never listened to it before. And we didn't even notice because it was just thrown in with all the stuff that we may or may not have listened to on Spotify radio. Um, so here, I, I'm gonna hope this works. I'm just gonna check my settings. I have a video here as an example, and it's a share sound. So this is a video by a company called Tangerine and they are a Canadian banking company. So don't worry, none of us have been fooled by them. They're, they're only in Canada, but it's a very good ad. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just play it. Hopefully it works. It's only a minute long and then I'm gonna discuss it afterwards. Hopefully that works for everybody. Um, so there you have um, a one minute, very simple ad, but what I think is a very good ad and it shows this kind of realistic working environment that you know jobs are terrible sometimes. Sometimes you want to sit in the bathroom and cry and not do any work. Or as you had the result with the, the babysitter or teacher or mother, one of the most difficult jobs in the world and the child shows up on you, which is something or everybody has bad days at work. So if you're at home and you've had a bad day at work and you see this advert, you would genuinely think that Tangerine understands you, that this company understands what you go through every day in order to earn your money and have a life. Um, and I am sorry to tell you, that's just not true. That it, it, this, this ad was written by a marketing team in a, in a meeting room you know, somewhere saying, how do we get people to use our product? But it's very effective and it works very, very well. So that is literally the how the Barnum effect can work from a marketing point of view. And next up, we have what's called the anchoring bias. And again, a very popular one and used um, very regularly. And it's also known as focalism. So the anchoring bias, it's a bias that uses our reliance on a specific piece of information. And that piece of information informs all future decisions. Um, so if we take a website, um, for example, typically when you land on the website, the first piece of information you, you see becomes an anchor point and then all subsequent pieces of information are compared and contrasted to this one piece of information. Now where this becomes very regularly used and used kind of all over the place is in pricing structures. And it's the example I'm going to walk through here. Um, so let's say you are going to get a new car this year. You have uh, a well-working 10 year old Toyota Corolla outside, but you, you know, it's been a tough year. If you're gonna, you're gonna treat yourself and get a new car finally. And you say, I've always wanted a BMW. Now, BMW is a beautiful car and you land on the BMW website, you go straight to the source and you say, that is a beautiful car. And that is a beautiful price. That's 107,155 euro. Um, now, by the way, I actually, the actual price is 190,000. I just thought that was almost too extreme. So I, I dumped it down to 107,000, 155 euro for this example. Um, but if you are a viewer and you see that and you see the price and you kind of go, wow, you know, 
for the everyday, like I couldn't afford that car. The average person cannot afford a hundred thousand euro car. And you're like, okay, maybe, maybe I can't get a BMW. That's just, that's crazy money. You know, you know, my wife would kill me if I, you know, buying that car. So you scroll through the website, you're kind of, you know, a little defeated um, and you land on the next car and it's the new BMW 5 Series, brand new for 65,434 euro. Now, 65,000 euro is still a lot of money for a car, but it's also a lot less money than 107,000 euro. And that's where your brain starts kicking in and in the background is going, well, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's a huge saving compared to 107,000 euro. You know, that's, that's realistic almost. That means I can nearly afford a BMW. So you're a bit more positive now. And then you, <clears throat> you keep scrolling through and you kind of come across a brand new BMW 3 Series. And this car is only 42,099 euro. And now all of a sudden you can afford a BMW. Now 42,000 euro almost sounds like a standard price for a car. It doesn't matter that there's a Toyota Corolla brand new out there for 25,000 euro. That, that doesn't matter. Right now, you exist in BMWs, you know, in their world, on their website, with their information available to you. And what happens is that you, this is the information you see. This is in the information you have. And when you're going through those and you say 107,000 euro, 65,000 euro, 42,000 euro, that 42,000 euro looks like you've almost saved money in comparison to the initial you know, introduction of 107,000 euro. And that is a very, very common um, pricing technique on websites and in real life that they will bring you, even real life in a car sales room, I guarantee you it will happen. They will bring you out this beautiful, big, massive, expensive car. And when you say, man, I can't afford that, they'll go, oh, that's okay. Look, we have this, this, this one and it's only this price. And you don't realize that that car has none of the features or anything else. You just see the price and you say, okay, I can afford that because that one, it's so much cheaper than that one. So it's a, dang it's a dangerous one. It's one you, you should probably look out for, but it's, it's how pricing stru structure works. And it's a lot less kind of, it's more of an easing you into buying a product rather than showing you just one price for one product. So that's the uh, anchoring bias or focalism. <clears throat> now, next up, we have the mere exposure effect. Now, similar to the halo effect, the mere exposure effect, again, is more of a branding exercise. It's more of a, a long-term kind of over time effect. And simply put, it's, it's the more we see something, the more we trust it. Um, and we, as, as people, we have a tendency to give undue preference to things simply because how, how familiar we are with them. So this technique is specifically popular with larger companies, mainly because they have the budget to do it. But <clears throat> if you think of the likes of, of Nike, Coke, Apple, McDonald's, these, these big companies that, that I would say dominate their respective markets. Um, and even though they're household names, whether you use them or not, you know who they are. These companies will still very regularly advertise. They will advertise on TV, on radio, um, Google, PPC, whatever it is, you'll see them on social, you'll, you'll see them quite regularly. And not only do they advertise to you, but they would a lot of time they'll release adverts that, that aren't even advertising a specific product. They're, they're more of a, you know, either they tug on your heartstrings or they're humorous or they're, you know, like a Nike advert that makes you the champion, you know, these kind of, these kind of things. Um, and this, this is quite literally the mere exposure effect in action. This is this company fully aware that the more you see them, the more you trust them, and you're definitely not going to forget about them. So generally speaking, these, these companies, these, the big dogs are not, um, they're no better or no worse than their counterpart or even their lesser known rivals that the companies are just, as I said, very aware that the more you see them, the more you trust them. <clears throat> now, sim similar to um, the halo effect, I can't really give a specific example here because if according to the mere exposure effect if i showed you a nike ad i'd just be doing them a favor so what i have here is i have um again a kind of a, a quick fact so i have coca-cola household name we all know them they are the king of soft drinks whether you think sugary soft drinks are the devil or you're you're a big fan we all know who they are and coca-cola will be no surprise to anybody that they spend more on global advertising and marketing than any soft drink producer anybody anybody else in their in their kind of industry and that's not a surprise they're 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 the big dog they're the ones that probably have the you know the highest profits they're spend the most on global advertising and marketing than any other soft drink producer what may be surprising to people and it was it was a shock to me simply because of the number but 
Coke averaged about $4 billion each year on advertising between 2015 and 2020. Now, just to say that that is the company as a whole, so that includes all their other products and it's international advertising. It wasn't just one continent or one country, but that still <clears throat> is $4 billion a year, not between 15 and 20, a year from 2015 to 2020. So that just, I mean, that number alone will just tell you how important they see it to be in front of you and to be regularly in front of you and to make sure that you know who they are. Um, and it, it's uh, it, the, the number still kind of baffles me. It's four billion dollars each year, and advertising is is insane. Um, so yeah, this is a mere exposure effect in action. The more you see something, the more you trust it. Um, <clears throat> next up is the scarcity effect, um, and we only have two two more individual biases left, guys. So hopefully, hopefully you're still with me. Um, the scarcity effect, and again, apologies about the image, maybe too soon, but I think you, you'll understand why I use it when I go through what the scarcity effect is. Um, and very simply, the scarcity effect is our brains will place a higher value on something that is less available to us, and subsequently a lower value on things that are more available to us. So the the harder it is to acquire something, the more valuable that thing is. And the more something is in abundance, the less valuable that thing is. Um, and this is a very easy one for companies to play with. And they, I would argue that almost every company that has ever existed has used a scarcity effect, even unknowingly um, or, or unwillingly, they've just used it. So the scarcity effect just creates this massive sense of urgency that that doesn't otherwise exist and doesn't even need to exist so if you think of you're in a shop like you know the toilet paper and you have only x amount of products left or or even like we saw in the pandemic where only two per customer this creates a sense of urgency around that object if even though there as as we remember from the news there was there was plenty of stock and all the supermarkets kept saying it over and over again there is stock guys it's coming in don't worry just make sure there's, you know, evenly distributed people were still buying trolleys worth of toilet paper, even though there was enough there for everybody. Um, I guarantee they still have much of that toilet paper in their house. How much do they need? But these only X amount left or one day only sales. Black Friday is, is a good example. Limited time offers, um, limited edition items, clearance sales. All of these, all of these kind of things introduced a sense of urgency that if you don't buy this thing now, at this specific time, you will not get it either ever again or at this price. And that just simply isn't true. The, the fact is, if a company sells something and it sells, they're going to continue to sell it. And if a sale works and they increase profits via sale, they're going to have another one. It's going to happen. Now, unless you start digging into industries like fast fashion, but you know that's just hell as it is. But it doesn't just work with sales and items. It can actually work for events. So if you have an invite-only event, it creates a sense of want and a sense of longing to be there because only the people who are invited are special enough to go. So therefore you want to go because you didn't get an invite, you know, classic, you want what you can't have. Um, and then another big one is queuing systems. So if you have a queuing system, either digitally or physically set up, it creates uh, again, a, a sense of hype and urgency, but also a sense of curiosity that, that increases the likelihood that people are going to want that object or product, even if they don't know what's at the other end of the queue. So as I, as I mentioned, a lot, and I mean a lot of companies use this and they do it a lot and it's very regular, but a huge abuser of this, um, and I, I find this kind of funny at the moment, but uh, is the hospitality industry. And I'm going to name and shame this one specific company. I don't know what I have against them, but uh, booking.com. Now booking.com, I took a screenshot for booking.com less than two weeks ago. And this is for one week in Vegas, in may like this coming may so we're talking towards the end of february in a pandemic i'm not even allowed to leave my country or enter theirs and i'm trying to book a holiday in two months time and they have if you ever on booking.com this is the kind of rule of thumb anything that's in red writing is the scarcity effect in action that's that's basically how it works so you have now this is the first page i didn't have to go looking for this this was immediately when i put in my dates for may on booking.com in las vegas First one, only five left at this price on our site immediately. Now the second one, it doesn't have red writing, but one other person has looked for your date in the last 10 minutes. That's, it does, it's not kind of in your face and highlighted, but it still is just slightly the scarcity effect in action. If you go one more down, we have book two times for your date in the last 24 hours. 
And then immediately, not even skipping one this time, but immediately below that, we have booked three times for your date in the last 12 hours. And every single one of those sentences is creating a sense of urgency and fear in me that if I do not book this right now, it will not be available either at all or at the price that they're showing me right now. And that is, I, I, I think it's unfair. It's, it's creating this sense of panic that you're going to panic by something out of a fear that they, they literally just created in front of you. As in, I'm not saying that what they're saying here is untrue. It's, it might be very true, but you also have to realize that the Mandalay Bay has 2000 rooms. So three po people booking in 12 hours isn't even a slight percentage of, of what, of what they're booking. Also on, on a, specific to Vegas. Vegas is made out of hotels. So if you are going to go to Vegas, you'll always find somewhere to stay. Don't worry. But so this, this scarcity effect is, is, as I said, it's scaring you literally into buying something because it's created a sense of panic that this thing won't be there again and it might not be there in the future. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a cheeky one, but it works. And to be honest, it's probably worked on me in the past and it, it probably works on most people. Um, and the last um, bias, guys, I'm going to talk through with you today is um, called the hyperbolic discounting bias. Now, the hyperbolic discounting bias is one that I have an issue with, and I'm going to try and not rant about it because I think it is a quite a dangerous one. Um, but basically, on the surface, it doesn't seem so dangerous. It's, it's a bias that um, people favor immediate payoffs rather than later payoffs. So they, if you, as a person, are exposed to positive outcomes, you would prefer the one that happens now rather than the one that happens later. And that is even if the one that happens later is slightly more beneficial to you. So you would rather have less now than more later, basically. Now, from a marketing point of view, two things need to exist for, for this bias to work. And they are, one, quite obviously, the tangible benefits. What is the thing that you get? What are you getting now? that makes all, what you do worthwhile? What is, the, what is your instant gratification in this scenario? And secondly, and I would argue almost more importantly, is the ease of use. So for something to, to become, as I said, instant gratification, it needs to be as immediate as possible. It needs to be easy to use, easy to complete, because if it is not, then you don't get something now for it, then you're not going to spend your time doing it. And even in a very, very simplistic, and not even in a biased way, but in a simplistic, um, Example I can give you is if you're signing up for an email newsletter, you know, you get a pop up on a website and it says sign up and get 10% off your next purchase. And you're like, that's great. I wasn't actually going to buy anything, but I might know because it's 10% off. And all it says is put in your email address and we'll send you. So you put it in, you click and you have an email in your in your inbox waiting for you. But if you had an email sign up form and it said put in your first name, put in your last name, put in your address, put in your phone number, put in your date of birth, put in your email, confirm your email, put in a password, then you're kind of looking at it going, that's not worth 10% of my time. So you're going to move on and you're not going to do it. And then even more on top of that, if that's the introduction you get, you're probably less likely to buy something in the long run. So for this example, I have a very real life example again that I actually, I bought, um, I think it was a computer monitor from Harvey Norman about uh, in January. And as soon as I bought it and I was kind of going through the payment process, they offered me this thing called tech credit. Um, now, tech credit is basically a short-term loan to get your tech stuff. Um, now, I'm going to just put it out there that I understand that if, if you were like, let's say a college student and you couldn't afford a laptop, then something like this is a great initiative that allows you to have a laptop now so you don't miss out on work and just pay it back while you're working. And that's that's great. But offering it to people is also, you know, it's a danger. So if you're, if you have a perfectly good 40 inch screen on your TV or TV on, on your wall and you're watching it and you see that your neighbor just bought a new 60 inch OLED TV um, and you're like, you're one of those people that has to, you know, competes with your neighbor, then you go into Harvey Norman and there's a 10 grand TV there and you're like, I want that one. And you're like, that's 10,000 euro, can't afford it, but I can give you, you know, you can get this small loan here for tech credit and you know, we can give you 100% of the loan. You just have to pay it back over the next number of years. And that's someone who can't afford something, basically being kind of swayed into buying something. And when I clicked, I clicked on it out of interest. I didn't need it, luckily enough, that I, I could just afford the thing outright, but I clicked on it. And the, it's these three icons I had the major kind of issue with. And this is, this is the benefits, as you can see from the title, the benefits of tech credit. The first one is keep your cash. Now, that's not a lie. That is true. They can give you up to 100% credit. And you can keep your cash in your pack, pocket for now. I mean, it doesn't say that you're going to be giving it to them eventually, but for now, you can keep your cash in your pocket. The second one, again, not a lie, manage your budget. 
it's very true. You can now manage how you are going to pay them back over the next year or so. It's the third one, though, I think is, is the issue. And it says always have the latest. So basically what they're saying is that you can always have the latest version of anything as long as you owe us money. And it's, it, I, it's, it's a dangerous one. I think it'd be quite negative, especially if you go into bigger, larger um, loans like home loans or, or not mortgages, because that's a different kettle of fish altogether. But, you know, home improvement loans or car loans or higher purchase or any of these kind of, you know, they, they are products too. And it's just important to remember that. Um, and that, my friends, is the, it's a hyperbolic discounting bias and the list of 10, that is the end of it. Um, so to finish up, I'm just going to talk very briefly about how we can, if or how we can reduce and avoid bias going forward. And there's been a lot of research into this, um, almost as much as there has been into bias itself. And there's some very interesting kind of papers and, and academic research out there that I'm not obviously going to get into now. I don't want to bore you with the, with the details. But the very, very simple and arguably oversimplified option um, or way of reducing bias is to become more informed in our decisions and ask more questions. So if you are making a decision or if you are, and let's not say small decisions, bigger decisions, then, and you, you're unsure of something or you don't know something, then, then find out, ask a question, ask people questions, Google it, just become more informed before you make a decision that, that you will later have to convince yourself was a good one. Um, now, in saying that, if you were if you're in Tesco's and you're buying toilet paper and you buy Andrex over Cushelin and there's a five cent difference in price, that's that's not going to change anybody's life really. If that's that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But kind of go back over my previous examples. If you're about to drop twelve hundred euro on on an Apple iPhone X, when a two hundred and fifty euro Nokia um, will do the same thing, if not more, then you have to ask the question why. You have to, that, that's where you have to say back though, is the iPhone genuinely better than this Nokia? And if so, where? And even if it is better, is it 1000 euro better? Um, and rather than entering into something that, that you may not be able to fully afford. Now, if you can afford it, and, and that's great, I'm not going to get into that discussion, but, and also if you're just honest and you say, I like Apple brand stuff because Apple brand stuff is cooler than other stuff. And that's what you want to do. That's absolutely fine. But it's more of a case of just, asking the question, become more informed, and then, you know, hopefully then you won't kind of be swayed in a decision that you may not want to have made. And that, um, everybody, is the end of the talk today. So thank you very much for, for joining me today and coming to Republic of Works Lunch and Learn Series. Uh, I hope I hope you picked something out of it. I hope I hope it wasn't too boring or, or, or terrible, but um, I'm now going to open it up to, to questions. Um, if everybody has one, I think Angie has a few there for me already.